Hello there, and welcome to the first part of uh, learning Fortran for scientific programming. Uh, my name is Paul, and today I'd like to teach you a little about um, the first language that I learned, um, you know, for a numerical analysis class. And it's it's still commonly used in plenty of libraries. Not as many people use it on a day-to-day -day basis anymore, but I think it's still a, a language worth learning. So uh, today, uh, let's let's start out with a uh, a simple hello world program. So program hello world, and then I'm gonna come to the bottom and do uh, end program hello world. And that's the, the framework of our program. It just starts with a program and then an end program. Now, here in between, one of the things we always want to include is an implicit none statement. And I'll explain later uh, why an implicit none statement is actually necessary. Then we can do the hello world statement. So in Fortran, we use this write statement with two stars and separated by a comma. I'll explain later how we can use these two star spaces to uh, write to files or to write to variables, but whenever we leave it as stars, which is the default, it just outputs to the terminal, which is uh, where we'll see. So I'm going to say write hello world. Okay, so then I'll save, um, and then let's switch over to... Uh, my terminal here. I was installing some stuff earlier. So, so, so we're back. I've navigated to uh, to where I have this file saved. Um, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna remove the out executable file that I had from before. So let me show you how you compile. Uh, a Fortran document. So I'm using the G Fortran compiler, which by the way, I'm, I'm working on Windows uh, because it's a little easier to uh, for, for me to record. I don't have a Mac and uh, I, I don't like using Linux to record, but usually I, I use, you know, just Ubuntu. So luckily Windows has an Ubuntu command line now that I'm working from. Um, as far as installation for how to do, how to install G Fortran, um, that's pretty pretty straightforward to do you can you can get that from any Google uh, query but so let's uh let's let's use G Fortran here and I'm gonna type the name of my file which you'll notice right here was executable one and also note that I'm in the same directory that this file is saved in okay so ex1.f90 all right so now if I just type this which I can do notice that when this compiles, in ILS, there's this A out folder, which is what came from my executable, um, right? And I may not want it to be named that. Uh, you know, that's the default if I didn't give it a name, but I can also, um, I'm going to remove the out. I'm going to go back up to G Fortran, and now I'm going to type a dash O, and then what I want it to be called. So I'm going to call it ex1.out okay so now we have this ex1.out file so in order to run that I'm going to type a period forward slash and that's just telling uh, uh, my command line where this file is actually found which is here where we're at so here we go and then this is hello world and that's great that's a uh, that's what I would expect it to be like but so uh, why don't we modify this program a little and I can show you how to take a user input from the command line. So up here, uh, I'm going to add a read statement, which is formatted the same way as the write statement. Uh, but now I'm going to have it write to a variable. So why don't we have the program take in my name, right, just like that. And now I need to declare this variable. Um, if you've ex 
experience with Python before, you don't you don't need to declare your variables, but in Fortran you do. And then I'll also notice that uh, you can add as much white space or blank space uh, that you, as you'd like to make your code a little more readable. So let me declare a character variable. You tell it uh, length equals uh, I don't know what's the longest name I can think of. Say, I mean, my name's easy. My name's Paul, so I'm just I'm just going to give it a, a character length of 20. Um, and then the way I do that is I do a double colon, and then I declare my name. Okay. So and then I want it to prompt me, and it'll say, uh, "What is your name?" I'll say, "Hi, my name is Paul," and then it'll right back out hi and then I separate commas between uh, you know my name and to separate uh, you know string variables like that and then comma comma it's nice to meet you okay and let's let's see how this does. But there's actually, uh, yeah, let's, let's go ahead and run this, and let's see what that looks like when we do it. Hmm. So I'm going to recompile. Well, let me wait. Oh, I haven't, yeah, no, no, no. I, uh, I didn't change the file name, so that's why I was, let's recompile, just like this. Then let's, uh, let's run this program. What is your name? My name is Paul. Hi, Paul. And you see all of this blank space here. It's because Fortran is is printing out the whole 20 character my name. So uh, let me let me show you a small function to uh, to cut off this this blank space. So it uses a trim. It's called a trim function, just like that. So let's let's recompile now. Uh, G Fortran. So when I rerun it, and I type Paul, it says, Hi Paul, it's nice to meet you. And that's perfect. Um, so now something else that I'll highlight, let's move on to the next example, is uh, the ending of Fortran files, or at least modern Fortran, is .f90. So when I save a file, I save it as ex2.f90. Okay, whereas whenever you look at older Fortran documents, they'll often just end with f. Okay. So let me uh, go over a handful of things. One, I want to talk to you about how variables are declared and used in Fortran. So let's look at a program variables. I can spell variables right. And program variables. Implicit none. Okay. Now from here, there are a bunch of different variables in Fortran. But first, let me show you how to comment. So if I use an exclamation mark, I'm gonna I'm gonna notate to myself that I'm going to declare some variables, okay? So there are, let's see, five-ish default intrinsic variable types, okay? So one is just real. So I'm going to declare a couple of real variables like x and y and integers, i and j, just like that. And then some complex numbers even. I'm going to say Z and W for those. And then let's also do logicals. I'm only going to do one logical. But let's do a TOF. And I'm not actually going to use this in this example, but I want to show you how to declare it. And this is the equivalent of C to a, to a Boolean value. So it's either going to be true or false. And so TOF, not time of flight, but uh, true or false. So then we have what you saw before is just a standard character, right? So, but whenever I do it like this, this is just a single character. However, if I want it to be 
uh, um, have more than one character, then I use this uh, length equals you know 30. Or if I declare it at the instance, like if I do my name equals Paul, like this, then I don't have to use any number. Instead, I can do a star, and the star will. Uh, but you can only use this whenever you're first declaring the variable, um, and then it, it says, oh, well, Paul is, you know, four characters long, so give it a length of four, okay? Then there are a handful of things that we can do with these variables, but first I want to tell you a little bit about this implicit none statement. So you know, a defining characteristic between like C, C++, and Fortran versus like Python is that you have to declare your variables. Um, but that's not totally true because in Fortran, you don't have to declare your variables either. If I get rid of this implicit none statement, I don't have to declare any variables anymore. Um, the issue is that Fortran doesn't uh, change the variable type based on what kind of information you put in it. Instead, Fortran looks at the name of the variable, like it might look at x and y and say, oh, x and y, oh, well, uh, those look like real numbers. And it might look at i and j and say, oh, well, those those seem like integers. However, there's no reason that it won't look at z and y and say, oh, well, those are, those are reals versus complex. It kind of arbitrarily makes up these rules that we don't necessarily want. So we get a lot more control of our variables by using this implicit none statement. And it's standard practice to always use implicit none in modern Fortran. Now let's uh, do a handful of, of basic operations so you can see you know, how these things work. So first I'm gonna start out with just x and y. So let's, let's let x equal 3.0 and y equals um, 10.0. Let's do a handful of little operations on it. Most of them are exactly uh, what you'd expect. Um, so let's do, let's, let's write out what x plus y would be. Okay, let's write out. And actually I'm gonna, I'm gonna notate this with a, a little string to help us understand uh, what these operations are doing. And then remember, we need a comma to separate um, different things. And we don't need a string to, to separate the x and y here because we're actually adding them together. So when this is compiled, it'll be one number. Okay, so let's, uh, let's do x minus y, x minus y. And I'm just adding these spaces uh, so it's a little easier to read. It's not necessary for me to do that, but um, I'm not taking place in C's obfuscation contest to try and write the most hard to read code. Um, so there's some other operations that we can do besides just addition and subtraction. There's um, multiplication, like this. times y and then x divided by y and by the way if you if you're already familiar with these basic operations you know you're welcome to uh, to skip this part of the video because most of it is almost exactly what you've uh, seen before. Say so the only thing that you know you may not have seen is is well, we have a an exponentiation um, rule like this, and so this is going to be x to the yth power, so three to the tenth power. Um, some some other languages you might see it look like this, but in Fortran it's it's the double star. So now that something something that I will point out is usually when you're taking powers, like if I wanted to take the 10th power of something, usually I wouldn't do it like this because there's a decimal in this. 
And so when Fortran sees, oh, 3.0 to the 10.0th power, it uh, does it in an, in an inefficient way. The best way to do this would instead be to do it to an integer power, because then it will literally multiply it 10 times by itself. Right, which is which is much more efficient than what it does here because I think it uses like a natural log trick where it it takes the natural log of it then it multiplies it by y then it exponentiates it I think I'm not sure about that but it's it's definitely less efficient when I do it this way so so let's real quick um, confirm that this is what it actually looks like so dot o Oh, I see what it's saying. Okay, so the issue here is that I need to give this a, a constant value. So it's not going to be changed from Paul. Okay, so that's 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 why it it, it didn't like that. Um, this is this is the C equivalent of telling it it's a constant uh, value, saying it's a parameter. So let's let's try this again. Okay, so this this looks roughly like like what we'd expect, you know, ten times ten plus three, three minus ten, three times ten, uh, three divided by ten, and then three to the tenth power. Um, so so that looks that looks pretty pretty normal. And so something you'll notice here is is for this real type, uh, there there are surprisingly few uh, decimal places here to these numbers. Um, in a different part of this video, I'll show you how to extend the decimals out. And so you can use double and even quadruple precision with your real numbers. Okay, so we've seen how to handle real numbers. And then integers work very similarly. Um, so much so similarly that I'm not going to go through and do this again. As a matter of fact, I'm going to uh, comment these out. And I, uh, where's toggle comments? Usually I, I know the keyboard shortcuts to these, but I want to explicitly show you exactly what I'm doing. So that way um, you're not like, oh, how did he jump around to that and that so quickly? Um, I, I tend to, when I watch tutorial videos, I get really frustrated when people do that. Even if this video does come out kind of slow, I, I feel like it's better for understanding. What I'd like to do now is handle a couple of complex operations. Um, so first, how to actually declare or assign a complex variable um, a value, right? Because it, it takes two parts. So the way that you do that is you say, all right, well, z equals um, complex like this as a function. And then I'm going to give it, uh, let's do 1 plus 1i. So it'll look like this. And then uh, W, I'm not going to give it an imaginary value. I'm going to just give it a real value. And I can do, I can still assign it like this. Now let's look at some of these other operations because you can actually do all of these operations up here, surprisingly. Um, and Fortran just it just understands complex numbers. You don't have to tell it anything extra. It, it it knows Fortran. It knows these complex operations really well. Okay, so um, let's let's write out. You know, just just for demonstration, like it's really surprising that you can uh, do something like uh, z to the w, th or actually even more interesting, w to the zth power. And it and it just gets it. It just it just understands it. Um, you you don't find stuff like this in C. You have to use a, an external library. Oop! What did it not like? Oh, I didn't I didn't include a comma. There we go. Okay. Ooh, and then it gives me this uh, 
this gnarly number, which I have no way of verifying this by hand because I don't want to sit here and work out, you know, three to the one plus i power. <laughs> but you but you can do it with a little bit of trig. Uh, so that's that's really really nice because a lot of programs, you know, in, in scientific use use complex numbers. You know, whether it be like lattice gauge theory, which is what I study. Um, you know, or, or even NMR spectroscopy, they all use like a Fourier series, which which uses complex parts. Um, so this is relevant, and there are some special operations that go along uh, with this. So if I just want the real part of Z, then uh, uh, real part of Z, then it's pretty you know easy to remember I would just do something like this and likewise if I just want the imaginary part of Z uh, then there's a similar function imag imaginary just I always and for some reason the my syntax highlighter doesn't properly highlight this but I I, I, I assure you that when I, I run this or at least I hope so uh, it will work. Yeah, so this does indeed uh, do exactly what I would expect here. So that's great. Um, there are also some built-in intrinsic functions that work fine with these imaginary numbers. Um, like for example, if I want to, I'm gonna go up a little. If I want to take the square root, square root of z. Then, shockingly, yeah, it will handle this fine. It doesn't give any complaints about types. Uh, Fortran handles imaginary numbers really well. And there you go. Um, you can probably verify this uh, pretty pretty simply. Um, oh, and then you can also take the uh, complex conjugate. Conjuga of Z. And then also uh, let's let's take E to the to the zth power, because that's that's one that's really useful for us. I'm just gonna abbreviate it like this. Yeah, and so square root handles fine. The complex conjugate, a-okay, looks great. Um, and the exponential of z, yeah, yeah, that seems like the type of thing that could be right. Um, so yeah, so this is this is our part on uh, variables. Okay, so now I'd like to talk to you about um, using if statements in Fortran. Um, and after that, we'll do a quick activity, hopefully. So let's consider um, a program on conditional logic. Sit. Man, I really have to sound that out every time. Um, Okay, so when talking about characters and, and variables and stuff, you know, we have these logical uh, units, like, like what I showed you in the variables declaration example. Um, so I'll have something like this. And what we want is a way to compare variables, you know, and talk about is this bigger than that? Is this equal to that? Is that, you know, close by? Um, and and so there are a handful of ways of doing that. So I'm gonna I'm gonna declare a couple of real variables as well. So 
So let's let's first of all look at this logical variable and see what it looks like when we write out for it. So I'm actually going to give it a value. I'm going to say tof equals dot true. And you'll see the true and false are, are typically written like this with the period on either side. So I'm going to just, just write it. And then let's see what that looks like. Okay. okay, so it just looks like this when you spit it out. It's just the T. Um, so let's talk about how to compare variables. So I'm going to give, I'm going to get rid of these two lines and I'm going to give X and Y a couple of values. So I'm going to say 5.0 and Y is 10.0. So first, we don't even need to assign these to be a variable. We can actually just write out something like x, does this equal y? And so notice that here I use a double equal sign. Um, whereas here when I'm actually assigning x to be 5.0 and y to be 10.0, I use a single equal sign. And here it's because we're telling Fortran don't assign these two together, it's saying return, you know, whether or not this is true or false. Okay, so so let's, let's see that. Recompile. Run it. False. 5 does not equal 10. Okay, great. So we figured out some interesting things. Um, and then instead of having write like this, instead we can uh, assign the value to TOF this um, but and that'll that'll work and it'll assign tof to be false all right but let's let's see what we can what other things we can do with this so i'm going to bring back that write statement just like that so we know this is going to be false but let's do some other comparisons um, let's see are they not equal to each other so i think it's a an exclamation mark like that. So not equal to. Then what about if x is less than y? Something like that. Let's see. I'm gonna blow this up so that way it's, you can see the whole screen. I'm actually gonna make this a little bigger in case someone's struggling to see the screen. So x is less than y. How about x being greater than y? And also there are a couple of other uh, things we can do like what if x is uh, less than or equal to y like this. And I, I remember that I remember how this is written because otherwise I would think that sometimes it's like this, but no, it's 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 like this. And I have to actually say it in my head less than or equal to. And then, and then you can just write it. Same thing. Oh, so so something I'll point out, because I actually made a mistake here, but it's a mistake that would compile fine, is uh, Fortran doesn't care if a variable is uppercased or lowercased. Um, you can go back and forth, and that's why in a lot of older Fortran code, you'll see it like all be capitalized. Everything is uppercase. Um, whereas here, it, it, it doesn't make a difference. Fortran will actually read this fine, and it's still talking about the same x variable. Um, I thought that I thought I would point that out, because that's why this implicit none statement is is important, because you can ac accidentally write down a variable that you didn't mean to write down, and Fortran won't complain. It'll just go through and it'll just do its thing. And then, so then, of course, greater than or equal to y. Okay. So we can nest all of these things together. Let me pull this to the side. Why did I get it to, why did it output uh, 
something here. I'm, I'm intrigued. Why did it output this 5.0? It, it appears that for some reason it actually output this X for some reason and I'm not sure why what if I if I do this if I do this will it give me the same thing did I, did I make a syntax error or something because it's it's highlighting this strangely What is, what is, there's got to be some issue that I made here. Um, I'm not sure what. I'm going to erase this line and just rewrite it again. Because there's got to be some error that's happening here. See, it's, it's not... It's not returning. Okay, I realized my mistake. Let's say I forgot that this is not a exclamation mark. It is a forward slash like that. Okay, so now let's let's see. Uh, let's see how that does now. Okay, there we go. That that gives me what I expected. So I see. So what was happening is I I had put the exclamation mark and then it was treating everything on this line as a as a comment <laughs> after the X, and that's why I was writing it. So like that, like that, a forward slash equal sign. Easy, mi easy mistake to make. I, uh, <laughs> I think I'm thinking of a different language. Um, okay, so let's let's move on. It shows you uh, mistakes like that are easy to make. So this is actually a, a more modern syntactical way of writing this. Um, in older Fortran, you won't see this. Uh, Fortran before Fortran 90, uh, it'll actually do something like this. So say I have the, the double equal to be equiv, like that. Okay, and then if it's not equivalent, then it would be an equiv, like that. Then for less than, it would be LT, greater than, be GT less than or equal would be LE, and then greater than or equal it would be GE. And notice this will this will compile um, Okay, so I figured out uh, what happened there. Um, I misremembered what this should be. <laughs> that's that's it. Um, this should be just EQ and this is just NE. And then I think it'll actually work again with the uh, with my X and Y. Let's let's try that. I thought it was giving me an error for a different reason. So alright great. Compiled that time and it should give us yeah it gave us the same output as before. You can use either as that you'd like, but like I said, this is this is an older style, uh, so use whichever you prefer. But it's important to know both. So when you're reading old school Fortran, which a lot of libraries are written in, like Bloss and Lapac, uh, they'll they'll use stuff like this. Whereas in modern Fortran, uh, a lot of people will use the the more modern symbols. So let's talk about how to uh, branch these things together. Um, so one way of doing that is you know this x is less than or equal to y we don't have to use this operation instead an equivalent thing would be to branch are they equal or sorry sorry are they equal or are they or is x less than Right, so I'll do that now. So, so we have two separate conditions. We have x is less than y, and we have a separate condition, x is not or is equal to y. Right, so this is this is the same thing as the less than or equal to. 
and we can actually add a statement in between of them that will consider whether or not one or the other is true. So that's or. All right, so let's let's take a look at that. And I'm gonna I'm gonna comment all of these out. Comments. I know it's this, but I feel bad using the the key shortcuts again and again. So that way you're like, how did you do that? And then it just and then it just happens. So this is all commented out. Now let's let's compile this program. True. All right. Cool. Yeah. And this is that's what I would expect. But one of these is not true. This are they equal? No. Because notice that if I do and this will no longer be correct. It'll give me a false. Um, so, so that's how you use these. And there are a handful of different ones. Um, there's and and or, those are the main ones. So there's also a, a nor, I think. No, it doesn't, it doesn't like nor. Um, let's see, can I do zor? Ooh, it's a legacy extension. It doesn't like that. That must be uh, an older Fortran logic thing. But the main ones that you need are uh, uh, that. So now, what if what if I just want one of these? Let's see. Um, and this is true. This this right here. If if I do that, but let's see. I want the opposite of that. Then what I can do is write uh, dot not like that. There we go. And that gives me false. Where I'd expect it to be true. So excellent. And so that's uh, our conditionals. Now something that I'd like to also talk about briefly is machine precision because it's going to be a little relevant in the upcoming exercise. So I'm going to get rid of most of this. And I'm going to say that x equals 1.0. Okay. I'm going to, in each of these lines, I'm going to have it write x to the screen. So right here, and so we expect this to be 1.00 or whatever. Now I want to divide x by 3. And I'm going to rewrite x to the screen because we want to see what it looks like. Then I'm going to multiply x by 3. Okay, and let's write x again. So three different stages. And so now in our heads we think, okay, well, we're just dividing it by 3, so it would be a third. Then multiplying it by 3 and it should give me back 1. Right, well it doesn't, it doesn't quite work like that always. Um, so let's let's see what happens when we compile this. So now here, there's there's something to to note. Where did this four come from? Like if you punch this into your calculator, you know you'll get 0.333333 onward. However, here we don't get that, and that's very interesting. Um, and notice Fortran is smart, and so when Fortran comes back here and it it multiplies it by three, it does get back to one. However, that's not necessarily the case in every language. Like, um, I know the point of this is, is for me to be doing uh, everything in, in Fortran, but I'd like to, you know, do something quickly in C. Precision in C. Let's let's do something very similar in C and see what see what C gives us because because Fortran sometimes is a little smarter than C. Now I, I know people aren't going to like that I'm saying that, but 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 the fact that it gave us back one here is is kind of almost unusual. Because so let's uh, let's declare what's a, a float x. I'm going to give x to be 3.0. Let's print um, a float, and then jump to the next line, and then x. Oh shoot! And I've gotten used to the Fortran syntax. I'm not including 
including any semicolons here, but I need to. So let's print that, and then let's divide x by By three. Let's print x. Let's do x times three point zero. And let's let's print it again because I'd like to I'd like to make a quick point about machine precision here. So like G Fortran, we use GCC for uh, C. So and I'm just going to do this to an A out. Is it okay with this? Oh no, I got these. I got these backwards. I was worried. I always, I always mess these up. Okay, so it, like, it's okay with that. So let's a dot out. Oh shoot! You know what I did? I did the, I did the wrong thing here. This was supposed to be a one. And C managed to get back to it as well, actually, which is which is really interesting. Um, something I'd like to try is set C, so let's set X equal to 1.0 minus X times three. Let's 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 see what this gives us out. Oh, that's interesting that it gave me a negative number, huh? So yeah, how, how did it, uh, I would expect this to be exactly zero, right? If it's exactly one, um, but it, it shows the, the point that I'm trying to illustrate here in that what is the smallest number that I can give that won't add back to one. So, and that's what we, we call the machine precision. Um, Cause these languages only keep track of a finite number of, of decimals. I mean, all computers only can do that, right? So when we divide, you know, and it doesn't, and it works out to this infinite series of threes, then at some point it truncates, okay? And so, and it might be very far away, and, and C might be smart enough that, and Fortran is, is definitely smart enough too, that whenever we come back and we look at these things, uh, and I multiply it back by three, it doesn't give me quite one. It gives me a little off by one. And so something I discourage is com comparing floats to one another, right? Because it, it might not give me quite what we wanted. So let's, let me show you an interesting little function called an epsilon. So oops, let's write I'm going to give x to be 1.0, and I don't need I don't need y right now. Let's block them off. Let's write out x. Let's also write out this epsilon x. I want to I want to see what these these look like. Let's do that. So this is a this is a very small number. And so now I'm going to try something where I add x to be epsilon plus x. Let's see. So so you'd expect it to be 1.000 and then this 1.9 somewhere along in here, right? But let's let's see exactly what that gives us. And it does. It gives us a little thing right here. This 0.12 so it shows up fine, but what happens if we divide epsilon x by two? Ooh, then it's the same thing as before, right? So, so what this epsilon is, this machine precision is, it's the smallest number that I can use to modify x by. So notice whenever I, if I changed x to be five, it should be a different number too. Yeah, no, so, so it's still in the same decimal range, but uh, if I do maybe 10, 
or let's do 20. I want to try and produce a different epsilon. No, it's still the same. Okay, well let's let's try 20,000. Huh, that's interesting. Okay, but but you see the point is uh, that there's some number that it, it only keeps track of. So it's actually I want to I want to try this and see what is when does it when does it decide? Uh... Oh yeah. Hmm. Yeah, see, see, there's, I think this is just, this just returns the machine precision for this general type. Um, because this definitely does not, uh, so in particular, the way that epsilon is defined here, and I, I can explain this. Okay, so I'm going gonna, gonna to draw here just using my mouse. Um, so the way that epsilon is defined is uh, you have one point zero right and what what is the smallest number epsilon such that this is still greater than one on the computer right it's not equal to it it's still greater than it and we can we can find that out using loops which I'll go over in a little bit after we get done with the activity but it's this epsilon that and it's the smallest number epsilon such that when you add it to one it will still be greater than one the problem is is this is not the same epsilon for five right so instead of it being uh, you know this let's see I think on the on the compiler it gave 1.19 times 10 to the negative seventh power I'm just gonna I'm just gonna say uh, it's going to be five times epsilon which is what I was looking for there on the command line. But see, this epsilon function only returns this value as it's defined by one in that type. Okay, so uh, where did my mouse go? So such that five times epsilon is still greater than five. Okay, so that's really what this epsilon value is for this number. And this is this is relevant so you have to actually multiply it by five so so I see what the issue is here now so like if we come back we can we can see this number because this is it should be X times epsilon right and see here oh we see the slightest bit of change right here so notice that if I divide this by two, it shouldn't show up. Oh, I didn't compile it. Oh wait, huh? That's interesting. It still gave me a number. I don't know why it did that. I'm very surprised that it, it continued to show up here. Even, well, this, this, it shouldn't be because it, it's, it's definitely a different number. Um, just divide it by four. There we go. Yeah, now it's now it's the same. I don't know. It should have worked for two, so I'm not. I, I'll have to explore around with that later. Okay, so now I'd like us to go over using if, else, and else type of logic. Um, now that we've learned how to do some of the logical operations. So, okay, so let's see here. Um, let's, let's give ourselves a couple variables to work with. Don't forget your double colon. Let's say that x equals 5.0 and y equals 6.0. Okay. So now I'm going to do an if statement here. So an if statement checks checks what happens immediately after it. 
So let's say uh, y is greater than x, right? And if true, then it goes on and it does some statements. So it says, and we'll actually, we'll, we'll write this out, y is greater than x. Wait, no, I don't, I don't want that. Just like that. And then let's let's we have to end our if statements. You know, with Fortran we have a program, end program, if end if, and and that's a common theme that you'll see: module, end module, do and do. So we have our end if, and let's let's compile this and see what Fortran thinks of our little code. X three. y is greater than x. Okay, good. Okay, well, maybe uh, let's change around the values. Let's make x 7. Why not? Something like that. Now, let's uh, recompile our program. And it didn't give us anything, because there was nothing to do. It said if y is greater than x, but that returned false. And so it just went to the end if statement, and it stopped. But we can actually consider, you know, branching logic here. So let's consider an, a different case. So let's say else if y is less than x. And we have to use another then statement. Then write, write uh, x is greater than y. Okay, so let's see what happens when we run like this. X is greater than Y, great. Okay, well, so let's let's do something a little different. And let's actually make them equal. So let's see what happens when we run it now. Nothing. So neither of these conditions is now true. So instead of creating another else if statement where we say y is equal to x. Let's just consider any other thing that's possible. So we say else, right? Well, the only other thing that's possible really is that they're the same. x and y are the same. All right, so let's compile and run this. x and y are the same, great, okay. So another little thing that I'll show you is how to organize your if statements. So you know, if you've done programming before, these things can get really complex as you uh, start to create multiple loops you know, that are nested within each other, so, or, or like nested if statements. So you have if this, well, okay, well then if this and this and so on. Um, you can actually label your loops. So I'm gonna say main loop. that. All right, and then we can main loop. We may actually not need to uh, do that. But let's, let's, let's see how this goes. So we want to be able to, uh, to label our things. Let's see, how did it, how did it like that? Um, oh, okay, okay, so, so it didn't like that I did that. There we go. And it does it just like before, but the difference now is that we can label our loops and we can specify which if we're ending um, and beginning here. And you'll see the same thing when we get to uh, to loops. And this is actually, I, I don't know why I called this a loop. This is the main condition. But in my head, conditions and loops are just, are, are, are very related. Okay, so that's that's the end. Okay, so with that, um, I'd like to announce what the activity that I'd like you to work through.
and that is I want you to do a quadratic equation. But not just any quadratic equation. So I want you to do a handful of things with this. One, take a, b, a, b, c from user. I want you to use conditional logic to determine how many um, outputs there's going to be, right? Because with the quadratic equation, when the discriminant is zero, or in our case, we're looking for things that are close to zero, um, when those things are close to zero, we only have one solution, right? So, so here, if I if I go back to this, um, all right. So x. So if you have an equation that looks like a x squared plus b times x plus c equals zero, right? Then you have a solution x that equals negative b plus or minus b squared minus 4a times c. Ooh. Redraw this a little better. Like this over 2a. All right, so we have some solution like this. Notice that if, if this part right here I'm going to draw it in a different color. If this is 0, then this plus or minus doesn't matter anymore. And then the solution would just be minus b over 2a. So what I'd like you to do is write a program that can handle complex solutions, real solutions, and single value solutions. Where, um, you know, each of, uh, so, so an assumption that you can make is that a, b, and c are all real. A, B, C are in the set of real numbers. Okay, they're not complex, but you still have the potential for complex solutions, specifically when uh, B squared minus 4AC is less than zero, then we have a complex solution. So I'd like you to use conditional logic um, to write a program that will do this given any real a, b, and c. Hopefully at this point you've all taken an attempt at the quadratic equation solver. So I'm going to show you a solution to it now. So let's, uh, let's bring this down below. I'm going to write program quadratic Okay, so there are some variables that we need to declare, right? So there's going to be a handful of real numbers. So there's going to be A, B, and C, okay? And then I'm also going to create a discriminant. Discrim in at, there we go, I think that's spelled right. Now, we need to take feedback from the user. So let's do write. And then I'm going to do my little trick from before. Advance equals no. Let's write enter in. A, B, C coefficients of a quadratic equation. Okay, and then we want to read in those values. Just like this. And so we'll do A, B, and C. So I don't need this anymore. Now, 
let's uh, the first thing we need to determine is the discriminant. And then and that's going to determine how many solutions we actually have. Discriminant, and that equals b squared minus 4 times a times c. Just like that. Now, I'll even write these together so that way it's, it's more clear that this is the discriminant that we saw from earlier. Okay, so... There are a handful of things that we want to consider. One is the case when we only have one solution. So we'll do that now. So what we want to do is say if, and this is how I'm going to, yeah, if um, the discriminant. And now this could be positive or negative, so I'm going to take the absolute value here. If this is less than the absolute value of b times, let's see, what should it be? Um, oh yeah, epsilon. Epsilon of b. Right. Then... We only have one solution, right? And so, so I'm gonna I'm gonna leave this blank for now, and I'm gonna come back to it. I want to address each of the cases first. Second, um, if else, if um, the discriminant is less than zero, then we have the complex case. So. I'm going to actually write this in the comments. Single solution. And for this else, it's a complex solution. So we have two complex solutions. All right. Oh, and then I forgot uh, there needs to be a then if here. Then last, we have an else. And the else is whether or not it's a. Uh, it's greater than zero. So um, that else, we have two real solutions. All right, and then I'm going to do my end if. OK, so uh, now let's actually flesh out what each of these can these possibilities looks like so I'm gonna I'm gonna give myself some space here um, so if this is the case then the solution is just minus B divided by 2a I need to actually make this where Fortran can read it but in my head I just had it as B divided by 2a okay just like that and actually we're going to wrap these in parentheses because otherwise it'll do negative b divided by 2 times a, which we don't want. We want negative b divided by 2 times a, like this. So that's why I have it in parentheses. Okay, so that's that's one. Um, have to remember our PEMDAS here. Okay, so if this is complex, then we have two different complex solutions. Right, and then I'm going to actually create a couple of complex variables that we can store stuff in, z1 and z2. Hmm. OK, so um, so z1 equals, now I'm just going to copy and paste what I wrote up here because we're going to stick this in you know, a complex, complex function. So this is going to be like that. 
and actually, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna do something a little differently. I'm gonna do two minus minus b. Let's do minus b, and then that. Then we're gonna add to that the positive square root of Uh, discriminant. So one of the limitations with complex numbers is that it can only do complex operations on numbers that are already complex, right? So discriminant is real, right? At this point, it's a real number, but we need to convert it into a complex number. So that way we can take a square root and get a complex number out. Okay, so and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just copy this. So then I'm going to change this to be a z2. I'm going to change this to be a uh, minus. Then I'm going to take z1, and I'm going to say that z1 equals z1 divided by 2 times a. I'm going to copy and paste this down below. And that's just the bottom part of the quadratic equation right here. Okay. And so we'll write out two solutions, and those two solutions are going to be z1 and z2. Right? Okay. Now, the two real solutions are even easier than this. So let's consider. Yeah, so I'm actually going to just straight up copy this, except that I'm going to create a couple of real numbers. x1, x2. So it's a little easier for us to follow through. So we don't need to convert it into a complex type because we assume that it's you know it's it's going to be bigger than zero. Right, and we're going to copy this again. Let's say that this is z2. This one will be minus. Right now, x1 equals x1 divided by 2.0 times a. And I'll copy this line, put it down like that, because it's the same thing. And then there we go. So we have uh, x1 and x2. All right, so let's see if this actually works. Um, G Fortran quadratic equation. And I'm going to make this dot out. Perfect. Let's see. OK, so it didn't I didn't get any complaints. Let's do dot out. All right, so. Do 2.0, 3.0, and 10.0. Let's see how that does. Oh, so we got two complex solutions here. Nice. Um, so, so it it said, okay, well, this isn't true, and then it defaulted to the other one, and the discriminant must have been less than zero. So that's awesome. So it works. I, I don't know whether or not these are correct. If I mess something up, but but it appears that our program works fine. <clears throat> Let's we can try it again with a different. Uh, set of coefficients. So let's do this and let's do Oh, so we got two real solutions that time. So it, it went from here to here and then down to this else statement. All right, awesome. So that's the solution to the first activity.